The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Hey, hey, Wolfpack! Welcome to Cat House, where today we're checking out a dead house! Houseception! Welcome to Dead House was actually the first Goosebumps book ever written by the famous master of horror, R.L. Stein, but it was reserved as a later two-part episode on the second season of his iconic TV series. Bizarrely, the TV series didn't do adaptations of Stein's books in chronological order, simply doing whatever episode they could manage to do a live-action version of at the time. The Haunted Mask might have been the first episode of the TV series, but it was not R.L. Stein's first Goosebump story. Welcome to Dead House was, but I believe one of the reasons why it was never adapted onto the big screen for so long was due to the fact that this one was one of those R.L. Stein tales that was kind of difficult to get perfectly for a live showing. A ton of crazy stuff occurred in the books, and naturally, the show simply couldn't capture all of his weirdness 100% faithfully. Tragically, some adaptations have to cut out the larger-than-life stuff simply because they can't provide it all justice. However, that little disadvantage still failed to prevent this two-parter from becoming a massive fan-favorite masterpiece of the spooky franchise. This tale of suspense is extremely popular, to the point of making numerous top 10 best Goosebumps episodes ever lists and making a strong mark on our memories. Naturally, we intend to give our analysis on this classic work of art ourselves to see if it still holds up that street cred by today. But, I should first tell all you book fans how close it was to the original novel. Spoilers! It's only half accurate to the original story, with, of course, some huge changes added in. Now, anyone who followed both Goosebumps the show and the book series is well aware of all the changes made by the TV series in order to make the visual medium flow more swimmingly. However, Welcome to Dead House has some blatant alterations done, nearly separating it entirely from the novel. It is faithful for almost all of Part 1 and somewhat in Part 2, but by the second half, it grows into its own unique entity entirely. And to be honest, I think it was for the best since I personally believe that R.L. Stein's original novel, Welcome to Dead House, was super unimpressive when compared to the TV version, and the show did much more to save the cool ideas than the book ever did. <coughs> oh yeah, I said it. The first Goosebumps book was an overrated, flawed mess, and the TV show did a superior version of R.L. Stein's plot. I know we all love R.L. Stein to bloody pieces, and Welcome to Dead House was cherished as his first hit horror novel, but that's also the problem. It feels like someone's first ever horror novel. You can really tell that R.L. Stein hadn't fully mastered his horror formula yet, based on his plot holes. We'll briefly go over some of the book slash show's differences, but I think the show did a much better job at the zombie concepts and scary fun than Noob Stein did. But, just because I think this is better than its original book form, does that really mean it's still great as a standalone horror adventure on its own? Well, that's what we plan to find out. So, grab your popcorn and keep your clementines safe, because we're about to enter R.L. Stein's first ever zombie story. Was this horror tale a sweet, nightmarish treat that we Goosebumps fans should welcome with open arms? 
Or should we bury it back underneath the dark tombs to rot away in the shadows? Let's find out. This is our review on the tantalizing Goosebumps 2-parter. Welcome to Dead House. So, if you can believe it or not, this Goosebumps special opens up with none other than R.L. Stein himself appearing before us as our Twilight Zone-ish narrator, giving us the lowdown. Hello, I'm R.L. Stein. I write the Goosebumps books. I love Wolf Entertainment. They're awesome. Subscribe to them or else you're a loser. Well, you heard, Mr. Stein. Subscribe to us. I'll wait. <laughs> Essentially, R.L. Stein appeared in some of his special two-parter episodes to promote his dark stories and warn the kids that this is going to be super scary. So scary that you might want to see it with your parents or guardians nearby. That way, you can all be traumatized together as a family. It's pretty enjoyable stuff. Plus, Stein was so humble to actually show up for us, which is more than we can say about Saw Gerrera and his lame green screens. So, Stein wins! Our story actually opens up with a family named the Benson family moving into, what else, their new haunted house. Yep, another horror story with an unsuspecting naive family moving into a cursed death trap. Some things never change. These are the main characters, an innocent family comprised of Amanda Benson, the daring snarky girl detective, Josh Benson, the whiny brat, the Benson parents, who are rare good adults in a horror story, and who could forget the family's stupid dog, Petey. They're moving into an ominous neighborhood known as Dark Falls, a mysterious rural town. In the middle of nowhere. And just to give you the idea of how horrible this town with a dark secret is, well, we get a few gloomy establishing shots where the kids bicker with their parents about how moving here sucks while also passing by some foreshadowing death omens to show off how dark Dark Falls is. I do enjoy how the episode wastes no time setting up a grim atmosphere almost immediately, introduces our heroes real naturally, demonstrates the conflict of how the family is at odds with each other over this moving decision with pretty real dialogue, and shows off the unsettling Walking Dead sets to hint that this Dark Falls place is a suspicious yet gloomy place. Look, there's the rest stop from 400 days. Now, for the family's actors, only one of them was in another Goosebumps tale. The bratty son Josh's actor was actually Marty from the fan favorite tale, A Shocker on Shock Street. Also, I think the dad's actor played King K. Rule from the Donkey Kong Country tune. Anybody remember that icon? No? Well, consider yourself lucky. They're on a happy family drive down angsty road, as the kids are naturally upset over moving into a new area because they lost all of their old friends and old life. But the parents shockingly don't act like dicks over it. You know, unlike some other idiots, since they do explain that they had to move here due to some money problems. So it is possible to feel for both the kids and the grown-ups. There's no biased option. Really great start. 
Plus, it's so powerful to make the heroes out as a normal family with relatable issues. Nothing over-exaggerated, which makes you hope that nothing bad happens to them. But this is Goosebumps, so TikTok got supernatural horrors a-knocking. Speaking of which, the Bensons make it to their new dump, but the... Stupid dog! And Amanda spot a creepy stranger in their dead house. Oh no! So naturally, they rush upstairs to check it out all by themselves. Sadly, the... Stupid dog! Gets lost, forcing Amanda to search all alone in the dark. She scours the creepy joint, but as you can guess, something is waiting for her. Sorry, I was gonna tell you I was home, after scarring you for life, of course. I'm just real twisted like that. Seriously, that guy wanted to traumatize her for a larf, and you all know it. This oddball is the Dead House's legitimate salesman, Mr. Dawes, who came here to get the parents to sign some final forms for him, but wouldn't you know it, he accidentally fell asleep inside of their house waiting for them. You know, like all realtors would. Oh, Mr. Dawes. It was so restful in the dark. I must have fallen asleep. I'm sorry I gave you Ah, yes. I remember all those times whenever I took naps while working on the job. Too bad I was working as a lifeguard at the time, since I wouldn't have lost all those kindergartners to the pool sharks. Now, here are some of the more noticeable changes between the book and its TV adaptation. Mr. Compton Doss was actually more of an attractive pretty boy who looked like the kind of face anybody would totally trust and not suspect of being evil in the slightest. Hence why selling the dead house was an easy job for him. But on the show, Mr. Doss is now Buck Strickland. A sort of weird change, but I kind of doubt the Goosebump show could afford a Matthew McConaughey lookalike as Dawes for this small two-parter. They also shifted the stupid dog into a different dog breed. The doggy Petey was actually more of a terrier in the book, but instead, he's now a retriever. I don't think it's that big of an issue, though, since the stupid dog is able to pull off the acting just fine. Though, I am disappointed that the show did remove the ginormous bay window inside of Amanda's new bedroom, since that kind of takes away the being-watched paranoia constantly present in the book. Granted, the show still manages to get some of the dread down perfectly, like in the novel, but I miss that fear for how our little girl was placed in a disturbing position and wouldn't even feel safe in the privacy of her own room. But again, not that big a deal, since the episode works around that nitpick just alright. Basically, these are the smaller changes, but not the massively altering ones changing the course of the whole story. Yet, just like in the book, Mr. Dawes gains the family's trust easily, but the dog knows. You better pray he doesn't snack on the monster blood. While Mr. Dawes assists the family in getting settled down in Dead House, the mother reveals that she brought a special antique wreath, which Dawes ominously glares at. Mrs. Benson states that she bought it from Sardo's magic shop since she thinks that it's a good luck charm with the power to protect her whole family from any danger. But that doesn't stop the relatives from hating on it and acting like a bunch of Doug Walkers. I thought we threw that out. I would never throw this out. This wreath is a good luck charm. 
looks like garbage. It's an antique. It's been passed down from generation to generation in my family. I've never seen it. That's because your father wouldn't let me hang it in the old house. Oh, they threw it out. I'd just like to say that I do enjoy the family dynamic in this quite a lot, since it flows so naturally. They truly do feel like an actual loving family, making us care for them as characters. It's so refreshing to see likable main characters in a horror story again. Ah, <sighs> I miss those days. They wrap up business with Old Man Dawes, but as things look up... We get a scary close-up of the hideous reef. <coughs> oh, yeah. You guys might want to get used to these spooky close-up shots of the magic reef, because there are many more of them in here than scary face shots of Lily D. <coughs> Like, we get it, showrunners. The reef is ominous. We don't need 50 reminders. Now, you're all probably wondering what the magic reef was like in the book. Well, here's the thing. There was no magic reef in the book. The spooky house reef was invented purely for the TV episodes only, and was not even a thing in Stein's novel. However, I am perfectly fine with that, because the Reef's existence here is meant to cover up a massive plot hole in the original story. I won't give it all away, yet, but basically, the Reef is preventing the plot from ending instantly, and adding a layer of eerie suspense to what would have been a simple zombie's tale without it. I think it was a great addition to this adaptation since it explains away a sorely weaker element from the book, as well as inserting more mystery and dread. So, it's all good, it's all good. Later that night, the Benson family sleeps their first night at Dead House. But Amanda feels disturbed by all the creepy weirdos she spots around her, including... The Shadow Man? I am the Shadow Man. And I will never harm the person under whose bed I live. How many children's houses has this guy broken into? Hold on a second! Isn't your brother Wolf the Shadow Man? How does that- So anyways, Amanda wisely has her whole family look around the dead house for the shadowy stranger, but they find Nada. The adults tell the kids that the house must be getting to them, but defend that it isn't as scary as it seems to be. Right. However, Amanda still worries, where she soon starts hearing creepy voices all across the dead house, making her question if she's just dreaming or if the dead house is truly haunted. Real mind screw, huh? And of course, we get another scary shot of the dumb reef. <coughs> The next day, the Bensons get their furniture brought over to Dead House, where their new neighbors also come by to give them free breakfast. Wait, what? Is this normally something neighbors do to their new groups on the block? They offer them free breakfast? Lucky. I wish my neighbors would just give me some free breakfasts whenever. The new lady here handing out the free food is Mrs. Thurston, who's Thurston to meet new friends. Heh, 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 heh. It took me eight days to come up with that zinger, but it was worth it. But she too gets creeped out by the ominous reef. <coughs> She tries bonding with the Bensons, asking them a few odd, specific questions, but the dog knows. 
Hey, how is it that dogs have the ability to detect when evil's afoot, yet they still drink out of the toilets and crap everywhere? I sure hope Petey here doesn't do anything stupid, like act smart all story arc, then foolishly wander off on his own in town later, because that would be pretty ridiculous. Basically, Mrs. Thurston tells the Bensons that they can totally trust her and they should explore their town, maybe even play with her kids. The Benson siblings then take their stupid dog out for a walk, hoping to learn more about Dark Falls. But we soon get even more creepy atmosphere showing off how unsettling this settlement is. Everyone in town is dressed in dark baggy clothes, shadows cover everywhere, and even the entire area is full of nothing but gray colorless gloom. The few townsfolk we do see are cowering in the darkness, refusing to even step out in the limited sunlight. Which even scares the dog! Wow, Zack Snyder's Punky Brewster reboot is much better than I thought it would be. Feeling all the love everywhere, the kids naturally go even further into the dark neighborhood, but they soon get surrounded. Instead, the siblings meet the Children of the Dark baseball team from the novel, but they get called off by their leader, a strange boy named Ray. Ray. Ray was a minor antagonist in the novel, who definitely does maintain his creepy personality in the show too, since the kid playing him does pull off a rather sketchy performance and has a more sinister role in the TV version. Not my favorite villain, but he is rather unnatural. However, Amanda is more distracted by him since she seems to somehow recognize this stranger. Do I know you? I'm Ray. You were in our house. I was in your house? You were in our house. I was in your house? You were in our house. I was in your house? You were in our house. I was in your house? You were in our house. I was in your house? I was in your house. You were in our house. I was in your house. You were in our house. I was in your house. Ray states that he used to live in the dead house, but he moved on up to the better house of the dead too. However, before the dynamic dunderheads can question him further, the other kids attempt to change the subject by asking them to play a little baseball. Oh lord, please don't tell me we're doing that stupid filler ball game scene like in the book. Please? Do you play baseball? I love baseball. I'm thinking of having a game. Great, I play first base. Not right now. It's not a good time. Oh, we're not doing that scene? Well, thank you so much, show writers, for cutting out the most pointless moment of the whole book. I am truly grateful for that. Yeah, the Children of the Dark begin to back off when some subtle foreshadowing forces them to retreat for some strange not-the-third-act-yet reason. It's still trimmed down from the book, but I think it does a good job hinting at something more to come from both the sunlight thing and the children acting as disturbing like all the other bleached adults do. It's almost more subtle than the Midsummer cult was, but scarier. Good stuff. Later that night, Amanda tries to have a better sleep night after her crappy day. But then, she gets jump-scared by a certain whistle. Hi, babe. You're part of my life. You are everything. I have something for you. 
The family bursts in the room, but dun dun dun, Tommy has vanished. Now, a lot of you are probably asking, what the heck was up with the Tommy Wiseau kid? Well, you see, in the original material, R.L. Stein had some of the ominous monster kids attempting to warn the siblings to leave Dark Falls while they still could, since there was a hint of humanity underneath their tuck, drowsy exteriors. Deep down, the Dark Falls children didn't want to hurt the new Benson family moving in and wanted to give them a chance to escape before the Dark Turn approached. Since they would ultimately fail to overcome the cursed town's power over them. All the strange voices and strange people appearing to Amanda aren't all trying to harm her or watch over her, but they want her to get out of here before it's too late. She and her family have to leave before the dark part rises, and it offered hints that the children didn't all want to be evil by saving their victims before they lost full control of themselves. A good story moment, but I won't lie, this scene is kind of meaningless by the end, since it's never brought up ever again. Yeah, it just kind of comes and goes. Not to mention, it fails to prevent the horror moments from still occurring, but we'll get to that later. Just know that Tommy Wiseau was supposed to be a tragic villain trying to help Amanda before the zombie apocalypse goes down. However, as the family searches around for Wiseau, the... Stupid dog! locates a clue, where the family notices a large gaping hole in the closet, causing them to assume that Amanda has just been hearing rodents in the house. Ah yes, it was a rat that took up the form of the Shadow Man. Don't worry though, dear old dad patches up the hole in the wall, and in a rather touching moment, he actually tries to comfort his frightened daughter in a genuine human scene. I really like moments like these, where the parents actually try to comfort their distressed kids instead of calling them crazy and hurting their feelings by not believing in their tall tales since it shows off the real strong bonds a loving family would have. The daughter does justifiably feel paranoid about Dark Falls and the evil residents, but the father tries to rationally work things out with her by explaining how they're financially struggling and they moved here so they could get back on their feet. It's here where the father unlocks the family's backstory. The parents were laid off from work recently, so they needed a more affordable housing area, which of course was Dark Falls, since for some mysterious reason, everyone in town is out of work and poor too. Due to the local factory closing down under mysterious circumstances, and the town lowered their prices to dodge an economic crisis. Basically, the Bensons moved here to seek out a new life without fearing poverty, and they thought it would be good to have a more affordable environment with other people who they think are also trying to rebuild themselves. Shall we say resurrect themselves to find that new lust for life. It's honestly a pretty realistic and tragic reason behind the Benson's family drama over the generic the family just decided to move BS from the original novel. I like this change quite a lot. The parents also get slightly more depth than the usual moronic tools most of R.L. Stein's adults are. So this is certainly an upgrade. I think what surprises me the most is the fact that there isn't a single bad performance in this two-parter at all as well. Seriously, everyone in this is on point. I can't even do my usual I'm acting bit since nobody here is even mediocre. They're all so good. Heck, even the dog is a good actor in this. That's how great these performances are, people. They made a dog a realistic actor. 
This is a vast improvement over the more meh Goosebumps caricatures who fall under forgettable. But by far the best acting comes from the Bensons. They all feel like real people with their own real lives and goals, making you see them as nice human beings who you do care for. The show also states that Mr. Benson is apparently writing a book and having the free time to do so grants him enough room to complete it. We lived for quite a while on the money we got from selling the old house. You know what that means for me, don't you? You mean you get to work on the book you're writing? That's right. It'd be funnier if the twist was that the dad was really R.L. Stein. That'd be hard to wrap around your head. So Amanda loosens up and plans to work things out to appease the others. But as they leave, the closet door opens. Ah! But enough of that emotional or sinister crap, because we cut to the next day, where the siblings talk about how weird Dark Falls is and how much it sucks. No, really? But uh-oh, they find a suspicious hole in their basement door that wasn't there before. Where, of course, idiot moron Josh just has to stick his hand into it. Oh boy, I think I know where this is going. Actually, nothing happens. The kids get distracted by the STUPID DOG! But, haha, -ha, we see that there were monsters in the basement after all. So, why didn't they attack the kids? I know it's explained exactly why later, but how come they didn't do anything scarier with that setup whatsoever? They could have done so much more terror, but they chose to do nothing. The kids go to bed again because I guess they're just used to all the hauntings at this point, but Amanda wakes up thanks to the zombie infestation. But when the family checks out the noises, the monsters disappear. Again? What are these ghouls powered by the speed force? How do they keep escaping perfectly on time? However, in a really tense horror-fueled moment, the family eventually discovers an old newspaper, revealing a chemical accident occurred in Dark Falls many years ago. And, as you can all guess, this chemical accident is what mutated the whole town into the gray, depressed zombie vampires who can't step out in the sunlight anymore. I know it completely gives away the oh-so-shocking twist that the whole town is made up of all zombies, but honestly, I still really like it a lot. This plot twist shows us the zombie town's origin story, rather than telling it in awkward bouts of exposition like the book did. R.L. Stein's novel had these long exposition moments that just didn't squeeze in naturally, while the TV show definitely improves upon this by showing off all the signs of the city being zombified and actually explaining the true origin behind Dark Falls naturally. The two-parter both shows us hints of the zombie virus and tells us through subtle dialogue. It's not Shakespeare, but for a kid's show, it's pretty intense storytelling that's very well executed. Keep it up, Billy Brown and Dan Angel. It's so good. The Bensons soon confront Mr. Dawes over this, fearing that the town might still be toxic to everyone due to the pollution obviously still clouding the area, but old man Dawes dodges all the questions and tells them that it's all good, it's all good. There's no need to worry about it. Right. Well, to the town's credit, it's still a much better place to live in than that dumb Carlsville. Ugh, their baseball team sucks. 
Meanwhile, Amanda speaks with Blonde Wednesday Adams here about the strange happenings in town, where the creepy girl asks to come inside her home as soon as the foreshadowing sunlight comes by. But when the duo bond, the scary girl gets creeped out when she too spots the scary reef. Ugh, enough of the scary close-up shots on the reef. It's not scary. My litter box is more scary. Amanda keeps trying to ask this girl some questions regarding the bizarre area, where the scary girl reveals that her name is Karen. She's the daughter of the breakfast lady. And she, too, moved here recently not too long ago. But the weird girl is too busy feeling creeped out by the... While this is all going on, we simultaneously get a different intense scene where Josh discovers that their stupid dog is gone. Josh panics and warns the whole family that Petey is lost, where thanks to the suspicions of Karen, Amanda suspects that the is not a lucky charm at all, but rather a bad luck charm, and that it's causing the family to get haunted. Oh no! Better ignore the reef until it's time for the climax then! No, I'm not joking. Even after finally suspecting the scary reef, Amanda never does anything about it until the final battle like adult. Okay, okay, we do get some smart moments, as the family does at least scout the entire area to save the dog first. But naturally, it's time to write the parents away from the kids, where the adults tell them that they can't continue the search for now, since they're having brunch with the Thurston family today. So it's up to the kids to handle their own problems. Yes, really. The Benson parents leave to hang out with the new neighbors. But to the show's credit, we do get the impression that the parents are really doing this to gain some answers from the residents regarding the zombie town. So they at least do something smart in spite of leaving the kids behind. So, I can at least admit that these parents aren't irritating morons like many other horror story adults are. Anyways, the Wonder Twins carry on their search for the... Stupid dog! Where, after some near reunions with Petey, they eventually follow the mutt into the local cemetery! <laughs> the ditzy duo break in, because as we all know, nothing bad ever happens to idiots in graveyards during zombie tales, but alas, they sadly lose track of Petey once more. But they do stumble upon a town meeting where all of Dark Falls is gathering around to privately discuss the Benson family. And it's here where the Dark Falls residents loudly and finally reveal that, yep, they're all zombies who lured the poor family into their domain as food for them to consume so they can retain their intelligence and immortality once more. Yep, the residents are evil! The chemical accident mutated the entire town of Dark Falls into vampire-zombie hybrids like the monsters on I Am Legend. But unlike most zombies, they managed to retain their intellect and memories by feeding off of other human beings who they typically lure into Dark Falls under the pretenses of being a humble neighborhood. Much like vampires, they gain their power from the people who they eat. They're apparently a dark cult who sacrifices humans by eating them in a desperate attempt to stay as close to human as they possibly can, and the Bensons are the next in a long line of victims. A lot of people thought it was kind of dumb that there was a whole zombie town where all the undead conveniently retain their human qualities. 
but I'm perfectly fine with it, since it adds kind of a unique flavor to the zombie mythology, and R.L. Stein rather creatively forms a deadly composite hybrid of both zombies, vampires, and even mutants to act as the supervillains of the tale. These zombies are actually able to hold on to their past lives by indulging in dark sacrifices to pass for human beings, but the toll it's taking on them shows us that they may look human, yet the monstrous part is still slowly slipping through at times. I've never seen that before. That's kind of cool and terrifying. It's that classic everybody-is-out-to-get-you paranoia plot that even the Twilight Zone and the Outer Limits were able to pull off. But this has full-on supernatural monsters slowly tearing away at that facade with their primal savagery. Really awesome monsters, I love it! However, I should also warn you guys that this is where the two-parter completely stops following the book as a whole. Now, in the novel, for some unbearably stupid reason, the townsfolk held all their meetings and sacred rituals in a large amphitheater outside in the broad daylight, which was all kinds of dumb, and there were several unnecessary, convoluted subplots and fluff that really added nothing to the plot at all. Many characters acted like total morons, there were huge segments of padding, dumb decisions were made by both the heroes and the villains, and so much should have been cut out entirely. Mr. Dawes actually returns in the book to act as a sort of pseudo-menace to the family for a few chapters where he tries to abduct and drive off with the children, people run back and forth all over the city, absurd shenanigans pop up, and a whole bunch of other nonsensical bullcrap goes down. But it was all painfully unrequired. It was too much. Just way too much. Stein tried way too hard to make it feel more intense than it already was, but the show very wisely trimmed it all down and got to the point super quickly. I love your work, Mr. Stein, but you didn't need to outclass the overly crammed writing of The New Frontier. All you need to know is that the town Dark Falls is populated by hyper-intelligent zombies, and they brought the family in here to kill them. But they had to form a secret meeting, because for some unknown reason, none of the zombies can harm the Bensons yet. Again, it's explained why that is later, but it finally lets us know that yes, the villains are indeed real monsters who intend to eat our lovable main characters, and they were really brought here because they were a poor family who nobody would miss if they were killed. Kind of smart writing for a kid's show, and it thankfully brings the plot down to a more properly paced level than on the book. Oh, also, the hard hat zombie there is actually played by the masked mutant from the fan favorite tale, Attack of the Mutant. Yes, he's the unmasked mutant now. Heh, 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 heh. The kids realize that this is a serious deal, but uh oh, they screw up again. They attempt to make a break for it, but Ray shows up to betray them. Hi. Ray. It's here where we get Ray monologuing about his point in the TV version of this plot. Ray informs the kids that he was really a spy planted in their house, studying their prey and causing all the traps to lure them out in the open so the zombies could feed. Huh. That's actually a much better position than his former Grave Watcher job he had in the book. He reveals that he got this job because it gets passed on to the previous person who lived in Dead House, like he did before the zombies welcomed him into their neighborhood. 
So, not only do they feed on humans lured into their town, but they also infect them and recruit them? What? Wait, if they're devoured by the entire zombie town, then how does that leave anything left to resurrect as a zombie too? The world may never know. Yeah, a ton of the zombie powers aren't really elaborated on that much, but Stein does hint that the typical undead tropes are still at play here, such as zombies eating people, infecting them with the Z virus, and raising them back to life. I'm not sure if that last one works successfully if you get eaten entirely by everyone, but I suppose these mutant zombies operate on cell logic. The town then tries to feed on them, but the sunlight burns the unmasked mutant, giving them ample time to escape, where we get a good old-fashioned zombie chase scene. Aw yeah! It's really intense and super entertaining. However, we also get what I think are some spats of dark comedy moments of the parents nonchalantly chit-chatting with their neighbors while their kids are suffering. It's kind of humorous, but it keeps interrupting the epic chase scene, which was the best part. Okay, it's still a little bit funny. Oh, we also get a cameo from Tommy Wiseau Zombie again, making me question what the heck was the point in having Wiseau warn them to run away if Tommy was just going to betray Amanda and come after them anyways. Not to mention, most of us probably forgot Wiseau Zombie was even in this. Also, wait a minute, this old lady zombie is standing out in the open sunlight. She doesn't have anything covering up her head or arms, yet she's not injured by the sunlight like how the other zombies were when they got burned by just a small ray of sunshine earlier. Great continuity! The kids finally make it back to Dead House, where they block off all the doors and windows, warning everyone that the place is crawling with crawlers. The parents are confused by this, but the Thurston family vouches for them and aid the Bensons in sealing off the place. Gee, I wonder why they're helping them with that. And this is where we finally get the big reveal of what our grand villains are called in the show. Would someone tell me what's going on here? It's The Walking Dead. The what? 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 The Walking Dead. Our spooky, menacing, goosebumps zombies are seriously called The Walking Dead. You think R.L. Stein and Robert Kirkman will see each other in court one day?
So, I guess we're going to have to call them the Walkers, finally reveal themselves, causing the parents to believe their ghostly warnings. Oh, finally, parent characters who are at long last helpful to the kid heroes in a horror story. Hell, it's about time. Karen warns them that something is provoking the walkers, where Amanda theorizes that it's the cursed reef which resurrected them and drew them to their home. So after some wacky bantering, the Bensons finally torch that stupid, non-scary reef once and for all. But, dun dun dun, the Thurston family betrays them. Traitor! They reveal that they were walkers too, and they start bragging how they fell for their little deceptive con. No skits You see, it turns out that the magic reef really was a... After all. The Reef was actually protecting the family from the zombies the entire time, and the Thurstons tricked them into destroying their only hope. And this was the true purpose of the stupid Reef all along. It was a magic story point meant to give the main characters plot armor the entire time. The Magic Reef was inserted into this story to explain away the reason why the zombies don't just murder the Benson family the first second they step foot into their death town. This was a massive plot hole in the book. For no good reason at all, the book zombies go through all these stupid theatrics and overly complicated villain plans just to murder this one family instead of offing them instantly when they were in town. It was a stupid element of bad writing that really held the book back because it made the villains look dumb and padded out a really simple story into a long stretch of nothing at times. However, the TV show not only trashed that weak moment, but actually added in more layers to the narrative that R.L. Stein himself never had in the first place. It's why I think the TV version of Dead House is so much better than the novel, because the writers gave a crap about telling a cohesive story and covered up most of their bases, so kids wouldn't get confused by the why don't they just eat them now question flooding all our heads. They fixed the story. That reef was a blessing, since it did so much good for both the Bensons and the story narrative itself. A darn shame it's dead now, because without it, the Bensons will soon be joining it, now that the Zomboos can harm the morons. This leads into another nicely tailored Walking Dead chase scene, where the family tries the Obi-Wan Kenobi tactic of getting to the high ground as the walkers pursue. It's pretty good. So good that I think it was used for the Walking Dead video game one time. Cue the epic chase music! I do love the nice touch of the zombies literally bursting out of the walls. That's real aliens of you, writers. Sadly, the walkers corner them in the attic with no way out. Oh no, it looks like Rick Grimes and Daryl can't save them now. 
But no kidding around, the walkers literally stop themselves by discussing who will take turns eating which family member in what order. Ugh, you zombies are somehow both smarter and dumber than the regular walkers are. How do you accomplish that? Big shock, the angry zombie mob bicker for such a long time that it gives the kids ample time to form a counter plan, where they realize that, oh yeah, they can use the sunlight to kill them. You see, every zombie in town evidently wears Marceline's sun hat to avoid getting killed by the bright light shining through their polluted town thanks to that mutagen, since the light can melt them away into dust. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? But the kids remember that they're on the top floor, meaning that they can just open a window and singe them away like the grampires. So they murder the walking dead with... <laughs> oh, gee, well when you put it that way, die, bitch! So, the walkers melt away, which is pretty wicked, but sadly not as gory as the book was. Curse you, PG rating! <coughs> so, after all this craziness, the family wisely decides to move away. But Mr. Dawes comes back, begging them to stay, promising them that he totally won't suck out their brains with bendy straws, pinky promise! But they ditch him anyway, as soon as he starts hilariously hamming it up. Subtle. Wait, who the heck were those other zombies coming out of their house? I thought all the walkers inside died. Why didn't they try to stop the Bensons? Also, Mr. Dawes lost his Marceline sun hat, yet he's still alive while standing out in the sun? How is he not dead? Great continuity! You know, Goosebumps, I was really falling in love with this episode, but then you kept having these non-sunproof zombies blatantly stepping outside in the sun to the point of confusing the audience. Why? Okay, for the sake of the book fans, I will warn you that no, this is not how the book ended at all. The Bensons originally killed The Walking Dead outside at a public theater because the Dark Falls residents were all morons, but in the twist ending, Mr. Dawes is seen by Amanda selling off the dead house to another unsuspecting human family where the cycle is implied to begin all over again. The cycle continues. It was pretty lame. And not to mention, kind of generic for a horror story to do, since it's even been done on the Nightmare Rooms Don't Forget Me and other better Goosebumps tales. The original book's ending was just pure crap. Crappiest. It was not nearly as memorable as the show's ending. Speaking of which, it's time we get to the show's twist ending. The Benson family is driving off, glad to be alive, with nothing bad happening to them at all. But then they spot their... Stupid dog! Petey, who somehow survived the death town and is hitchhiking on the side of the road. They retrieve their retriever, glad that he's safe now, but uh-oh, the... Stupid dog! Picked up something himself. Everyone's done. The end. 
Wait, the dog is a zombie too now? Not that this wasn't a creepy twist and all, but how the heck is the zombie dog still kicking when he was standing outside in the sun? He was both outside for hours and is sitting by the large car windows, yet he doesn't get killed by the sun. Ugh, you almost had a perfect score, dead house, but this, this scene kind of dropped the ball. So yeah, dead but it's still not over yet, because we then cut to R.L. Stein personally interviewing the stupid dog. Yeah, seriously. Eating for a dog, you're a great actor. Hey, that's what most critics say to Brie Larson. But the master of horror twists gets a shock himself. Uh, you're acting now, right? Dang, that dog has a high body count. This is why you should adopt cats, people. We have nine lives, therefore never come back as walkers. Anywho, that was the grim conclusion to the Goosebump special, Welcome to Dead House. How does it hold up? Well, I think this one is still an amazing classic. Welcome to Dead House not only improves upon the weaknesses of Stein's first ever Goosebumps adventure, but it actually blows it out of the water. The showrunners heavily improved the less than stellar elements that held the book back, grant the characters slightly greater traits to make us relate with them, sews up the glaring plot holes plaguing the book, makes the monsters more subtly unsettling rather than in-your-face terrifying, showcases decent acting, builds up to a more satisfying finale that the book struggled at, grants kids some surprisingly remarkable and disturbing horror, gives zombies a new creative spin never done before, tells a more well-paced plot, and best of all, is just great scary fun. I think Welcome to Dead House was one of the best Goosebumps episodes of the series. Sure, it had a lot of reworking done to it, but unlike other adaptations, the changes made did work out in its favor and made it more popular than ever. I'm sure this is going to be a very rare thing to say, but I thought the movie was better than the book it spawned from. Unfortunately, the only bad parts to it, I do have to say, were the inconsistent continuity moments involving the sunlight weakness for the zombies. I really didn't want to hold this against the two-parter. Believe me, I truly didn't. Sadly, the fact that the zombies are briefly standing in direct sunlight is kind of distracting, but they do not ruin the episode at all. I thought for sure the inconsistent sunlight moments were just accidents on set, and I didn't want to be harsh by holding them against the story as a whole. However, I have to, because the twist ending has the stupid zombie dog blatantly standing out in the bright sunlight. Again, this was a weakness in the story, but it did not ruin it for me even a little. And don't say, Aw, come on, cat, it's just a kid's show. Give it a break. Kids are going to be the most observant viewers of all, and will most likely be as confused at all the obvious zombies standing out in sunlight moments as the adults are. So no, that's not a strong excuse. But I won't dwell on it. The story as a whole is phenomenal. I think it does great new concepts for the zombie genre and offers up kids an incredible spooky tale of suspense. While a ton of people blow this one off as being goofy for the mere concept of a fake zombie town, I will argue that much like the town of Dark Falls, there's so much more horror deep down than what we see on the surface. So, I grant this Goosebumps 2-parter a gold skull.
It came so close to perfection. But like I cried about earlier, the shining sunlight weakness got a bit inconsistent. However, there is so much more to this story, thanks to the showrunners salvaging all of Stein's greater concepts and committing to his decent scary ideas. I highly recommend this one, because it is a very fun, yet different type of zombie tale that pays loving respect to the old, but also tries to be something unique in its own right as well. It's a welcoming addition to the Goosebump series that shows off an outstanding production value, especially compared to other episodes of the franchise. Go and see it. While Welcome to Dead House might not win over everyone, it's certainly so interesting that it's to die for. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, or just tune in for more videos posted here on Wolf Entertainment. I'm your host, Catastrophe, and I hope you always remember to lock your doors and windows before going to bed. Otherwise, zombies will break in to watch you sleep. See you all next time!